Hey, hi, I'm Lynn Prozen. I am a um, preschool through grade four teacher in New Jersey. So um, I'm kind of curious on how people start the nature journaling with their classes. Um, what sort of activities do you start with and what sorts of things are um, good for each grade level? So I'm thinking maybe, you know, when do we really start focusing on the drawing of the detail because of the um, coordination that um, kids have. So I'd love to hear any ideas on that. And and your 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 the focus of your work is with um, with with real young youngsters, right? Yeah, preschool through grade four. And I have the opportunity. I, I'm the science teacher at our school, so I see everybody in those grade levels. Okay, I, I need to run and grab my notepad. It's just over there, so I won't be long. Um, but I need to write this down. See, that wasn't that long. Um, so, um, does anybody have any thoughts and ideas about that? So, um, getting started and and how when you're getting started with with young youngsters, um, has anybody had any experience or any strategies that you want to share? Hi, I'm Sue. I'm from New Jersey too. Um, and I've done it with little kids where um, we make a really simple journal and I'll give them a scavenger hunt of things to look for. So um, we're, we're doing it together. You know, a lot of times we're not I'm not saying go out like with the older kids I'll say do this this and this and I'll send them out but with the little kids we all so that they can see me doing it and just feed off of each other so that's the way I do it so uh, am I understanding you correctly um, and and you're you're Allison you said no I'm sorry Sue so, uh, so, 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 so you're saying that you like to have activities that are, are, are simple, clear, and structured, um, and things that you are doing together so that there's, um, you're not just sending people out in the forest and say like, you know, journal for the next half hour and then come on back. Yes. I teach, um, four-year-olds and sending them out on the trail not a good idea. <laughs> it, it, it's nice to come back with the same number of students that you started with, isn't it? Kinda, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, other other thoughts along this line? Um, yeah, I've got one. Um, I think it's important for when nature journaling that it's not a graded exercise, so that like you're tell tell the kids, you know, you're not being graded on this. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, that this is theirs. So, um, you know, if they don't want to share it with other people, they don't necessarily have to. Um, and, uh, also that it doesn't have to be just drawings. You know, if a kid likes to write, some kids like to write, um, they can write or, um, you know, use different tools, take measurements, things like that. So there's more than just drawing because some kids don't like to draw, um, or they're really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like I have a girl who she likes to draw, but she doesn't, she doesn't think she's good at it. And she doesn't like the other kids to critique her or, so she doesn't like to share them, even though I actually think she's very good, but she just doesn't have that um, confidence. Um, so that's kind of when I start out a group of kids nature journaling, I make it a point to tell them like, this isn't graded and, um, this is yours. You're doing this for you. Um, so that's 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 very helpful. And also, just briefly introduce yourself so we just start to to know each other. I'm Kathy. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and I run an environmental education program for kids. I do guided hikes, nature journaling club, science classes, art class. I do a lot of different stuff. <laughs> so homeschool nice. community mostly, um, but a kind of branching out as well good good well, th thank you um does 
Uh, so uh, um, there's a reminder from Melinda that once you sort of cycle out of uh, when you're not speaking, just to go back over and mute yourself, just so that we don't pick up more extraneous background noise. Um, that was those were really useful thoughts and suggestions. Um, does anyone else have uh, things along this topic to share? We're looking at ways of initially engaging young people and um, helping them get started with nature journaling. Yes, this is Jan Ruby Crystal from Massachusetts, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Jack. And um, I work at a nature club, at an, uh, a wildlife sanctuary in Massachusetts. And it's, I work with, I have an art house there and I work with children. It could be as young as like a year old, they come to me all the way up to, you know, teenage and adults and grandparents, everybody comes. And sometimes they come alone, sometimes in clusters. So I always have to be ready to engage whoever shows up. And one thing I found that's pretty universal, even for little kids, is I have these paper bags and inside the paper bags, I put a variety of different things that we find right in and around our sanctuary. So it could be um, a walnut, um, it could be a, a shell down by the seashore, it could be um, some kind of a, a turtle shell, all kinds of things. So the idea is that the kids get to touch it without seeing it. And at first what we do is we ask them to guess. You know, for the little babies, it's just tactile and they're feeling it and the parents are saying what does it feel like and so on and so forth but as the kids get older we eventually have them uh, draw very simple drawings of what they felt when they were touching it and then we lay out all the drawings and we lay out all the things they everybody reveals what they had and mm. it's so much fun because people they want to match up what goes with what and it's so great to see it so that's a simple way to engage them Another way that I engage, um, and is this doesn't have to do with drawing, but it has to do with experience. And we'll go on a little nature walk and I'll ask everybody to pick up five or six things that they love. And then we bring them all back to our picnic tables where we work. And we just have everybody combine their things to make these little sculptures. And they could make them either in the dirt around the picnic tables or they can make them on the table themselves. And we don't glue them down or keep them, but it's a chance for everybody to put all their stuff together and see what it, what it could be. Um, how does a feather relate to a rock? Um, you know, how does it to a shell? What's the difference in shape and color and size? And then a further thing that we do is sometimes I just have students look at, like if we're working with color and I'm trying to introduce the concept that things have all different colors, we might get out the paints and the same thing happens where there's a bunch of stuff on the table and we just try and make those colors that we see. And it's like, just, it's just like a pure, wow, I can do it. Look at this color and whoa, it's a little too purple. What might I add it to it to make it look more brown? You know, and stuff like that. It, it's all very experiential where I work. I don't have to grade anyone and it's just done for pure, an enjoyment and activities that families can engage in together, which is really important. John, those are really, really helpful thoughts. The, mm -hmm. um, so just to kind of shine a light on a couple of things that she's, she's doing there. Um, there's, there's play, there's adventure, there's exploration. So you're not, um, the journal is great for focusing Right, but first she's, you've got to engage and then focus. So engage first and then focus, focus later. The journal is a wonderful tool for, for getting that, that focus. Um, so she's using, and um, uh, Kathy also mentioned this about getting them to use their senses. Um, Sue was getting them to, uh, 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 Jan, Jan was getting them to, to feel things, right? And to, um, and Sue's also just saying use, uh, sorry, Kathy's also saying uh, to use the, all your senses. So to be smelling things where appropriate, tasting things, um, that always is in controlled environment with, with caveats around it. Um, the, um, the, in that, that, that last example, you're also 
you know, you're, you're looking at, at, at colors. You can do the same things with engaging your senses. What sounds are you hearing? Initially, just discovering that your body is this sense apparatus with which you can sample your environment, that's, that actually is a, that's a learning objective right there. And to deliberately, deliberately be doing that, you know, how can you use your, your senses to um, engage the environment around you and, and to figure out what's, what's going on? You know, and when scientists are using microscopes or telescopes um, or all these other sorts of gizmos, what those are doing is those are just taking one of your senses and enhancing it a little bit perhaps bringing in part of a spectrum that you otherwise, or a size that you wouldn't be able to see. But initially, just, just getting people to make the most out of what you've got right here, that's a really, really big deal. So I, I like those ideas of starting with things that, um, that are, are really sensory. And, and also, we, we heard there, there was, there, was, there was kind of craft and play um, you're, you're, let's find a bunch of things. Ooh, and now let's build something with it. And it's, it, I mean, it's, it sounds joyful to hang out in, uh, in, in Jan Ruby's class there, right? You kind of, you want to be in on that, right? Um, I, I, I want to be going around with my little bag of treasures. Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. So whatever you're doing, um, Especially when you're you're starting something off, um, I like to do things that where we get to we get to have fun. Now, if you are doing things outside, um, outside is crazy big fun, hyper distracting environment, um, and the and and I think that that's that's good. It's a stimulus rich environment. Um, sometimes we take kids out of stimulus rich environments because we say we want you to focus on just this thing right here, right? But, but being in that for your brain development, that's awesome. For getting kids in flow states, that's awesome. Um, but be aware that the first several times you take kids outside, if it's new, um, there will be a huge element of chaos, a huge element of chaos. Um, I talk to people about how when you are journaling, the first few drawings of any day, those are your sacrificial pancake drawings. Those are those, those drawings, they're, they're gonna turn out funky because you just need to rewire your brain. The first few times also you take a group of students outside, the chaos level will be way up. And that's just to be expected, right? But, um, once they kind of realize that, oh, this is also part of our classroom and we're doing this on a regular basis and we will get to come back here. And my teacher does know how to play. If I follow her or him and um, those, those guidelines, you know, they're going to take care of me and this is going to be really fun. And they will kind of buy more into your agenda. The first time you take them outside, they're like, this is going to be our only field trip. And so let's play as hard as we can and blow off any of your learning objectives. So um, do kind of, you know, there, there, there's an accepted level of, of chaos, but do know that that chaos, it gets better as people kind of go like, oh, now we're kind of going outside, we're journaling, I know what I'm doing. They'll get increasingly focused. Um, the, when you start to introduce your journal, um, there's a couple of ways of doing that. And what you want to happen is for kids to kind of buy into their journal, that their journal is something that they love. They really, really like their nature journal. Um, so it, having it be a physical thing that they can pick up is, is good. So just a few pieces of binder paper on a clipboard with a rubber band you can go do journaling activities, but you don't end up having a journal. And something that's nice about having a journal is that as you are progressively doing things, you're building all those experiences in the book. And they can, you and they can easily look back at it and kind of go like, oh yeah, I see, I see what's, what's going on here. Um, so ways of getting them to buy into it. Um, if you are, um, if you have a program and you're doing sort of, you've got more time for, 
for, for kind of crafts, those sort of things. You can create journals as a craft. Where Jack, Jack can, I sh can I share when, you, when you're at a stopping point? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, um, I, along those lines, I uh, worked with um, a teaching about nature and nature awareness with um, preschool age kids and also a grade school level. And um, my first thought with nature journaling was like not focusing on journaling itself with the younger ones, but I do more, um, you know, nature awareness and nature play. And so like Jack was saying, really engaging them outside. So I would say for my preschool age kids, what we do is really focus on, you know, understanding the behavioral schema that all humans, um, you know, show, right, in their development. I think t those of you who are teachers can understand that there are all these different behaviors that um, little humans show, and they show them in a different different ways, and they grow in different, you know, timelines. But there are things like um, trajectory, you know, kids just want to throw something, right, or line something up. Um, the connecting schema is sticking things together. So you know how kids want to put Legos or blocks together, right? Sticking stickers on things on top of stickers on top of stickers, right? Or um, like enveloping, like hiding things, right? Covering things up. And so understanding those schema and bringing them outside. So I teach outside and what we do is we just engage in their senses, right? Because nature is the best classroom. It is stimulating on all the senses, which is actually really great for their brains. And it helps develop them so that they're ready to be in cl the classroom when they're, you know, older. So, you know, what I do is really go out and like um, Jan, was it Jan was saying, you know, go and collect things. You know, the little kids are just so into collecting. So we give them little buckets and we're going to go look for nature treasures. And, you know, although they're not drawing in a nature journal, you're preparing them so that when they're able to draw, like the hand-eye coordination is developed, they're already like practiced seeing nature in a different way, right? Being led by you, the, your, the teachers of the younger children, so that you're preparing their brains and their hearts to open and see and to be in wonder and awe. So I think, you know, not worrying, I think someone else had said that too, about like, you know, it doesn't have to be um, drawing, right? I mean, part of this, you know, leading up to drawing, is being in nature and having fun and being playful and you as the adult you know emulate that you know we need that too as adults right we need to play in nature so whatever you can do to nurture yourself um is is awesome um i really like joseph cornell's sharing nature um you can go online he's got some great books it has been um really great it's just jack is talking about the flow states it's super simple you know engaging capturing their curiosity and then once they're already in it so when they're in it and excited then you can look closely and then as they look closely they're just kind of mellow out and they're ready to receive something that's more in depth and then if they're older you know they're ready to draw something um i taught a nature class with third graders in a, a public school they were it was a waldorf inspired school so a lot of those children were already kind of used to being in nature and drawing and using crayons and coloring but what i did is we created nature journals and it was super simple um we didn't have fancy paper so we took printer paper and we for the older ones we fold them in half and we sewed the center but for the third graders, I think we just hole punched them, three hole punch. And then they had watercolor paper, they had painted on it. And we um, three hole punched everything, we tied them up with string. And then they all decorated their nature journals and they were so excited. And like what Jack said, you want them to love that journal. And so, you know, what that was really helpful because then they're creating, right, this special place. And then we talked about what we're gonna use it for. And then what I did with the children is, like Jack said, the first time you go out them, it within it's chaos, right? Because they're only used to going outside for recess, which is go and do whatever you know, whatever you want, and get out that you know energy that's built up from having to sit and still in class. So I I did what Jack was saying is like I needed to go and just allow for that chaos to happen, and then but come up with games, um, nature games, active games, go searching for things together to kind of rein that in so that they started to get used to this nature class as something that was fun and that there was this focus and that we were gonna do this together. And with, with that, those, that, that school, the third graders I worked with, I think I worked with two classes, so like 50 students, um, 
they were all so excited about drawing what we found because we were excited outside. Like in the fall, we found acorns. And so we collected, you know, handfuls of acorns and then we held them together and we looked at them, we compared them and noticed that they had different sizes and their caps were shaped differently and they're different colors. And we wondered about that as a group. Then we went back to the classroom to a place where they had their colors and then they would draw. And you know, at third grade, they're like just starting to draw representations of re reality. So, you know, they're not necessarily gonna look exactly like it, but the cool thing about these third graders is they didn't care. Like something about their brain, they didn't care that it didn't look exactly like the acorn. Um, fifth graders, on the other hand, were a totally different group. You know, they're very self-conscious. They drew really small. They were really, used, you know, just really anxious about it. But the third graders were great, you know. And I think that just tapping into that excitement and joy and having fun, you know, because if you're not having fun, why are you having them draw, right? Because if they're not really ready to receive that information, then, you know, th that's lost. That moment is lost. So as much as you can, you know, just build on that excitement because they are learning, right? You may not have a journal entry to show for it, but they're getting ready to receive more information. So that's kind of what pops up for me when I think about, you know, the younger children and, um, you know, kind of getting them to buy in and how do you start with the process? Um, and yeah, like rubbings, you know, and Jack has his books. I really recommend the um, Opening Your Eyes Through Nature Drilling. I think it was the first version, the, the, the free download one that has some really great um, lessons in it. You can adapt some of those to the younger students, which I did. Um, so, you know, those are, those are my, my two cents that come up right now. Thanks, back to you, Jack. Uh, thank you, Melinda. I so I have a couple of quick activities that kind of go with Melinda's. Um, and the one, it was really funny because we did it, we actually set the activity up for the younger kids, but in the spring we merged our two programs um, because not everybody was coming to class. Um, and we did this, it was just a jar of water and sponges, but it said smelling potion on it. And um, the idea is they take the sponge, they wet a leaf, and then see how the smell might change. So it was really funny because we wanted to do it with the younger kids and I'm like, oh, they're gonna love this. But it was really funny because the like fifth through ninth graders also loved it. And I didn't tell them it was just water. So they literally all thought it was something special. And my daughter's yelling, no, I did not. <laughs> but they're like, it's, uh, some of the kids were like, what is this? Like, oh wow, stuff really does change. Anyway, it was really cool because the older kids got a kick out of it. And, you know, later I was like, yeah, it was just water guys. Um, but that was a really fun one. And then I also, um, so we're in Arizona, so don't have a lot of color generally most of the year. Uh, it's either brown or green, but I uh, got paint swatches from like Home Depot and um, we, I put them on um, paint sticks, like paint stirring sticks. And then the kids, you know, get a couple and they have to go around and match the colors to things in nature. Uh, the cool thing with it is I put some really weird colors in there. Um, like colors kids wouldn't normally think about like pinks um, and I don't know what else. But Anyway, it was really cool because they actually, when they started really looking, they would find things that had like a shade of pink in it, like a rock or, um, so that was really neat too. And they, like, again, even the older kids loved that exercise. Um, and I, I did those with, as part of my, uh, like nature journaling and observation class, um, just to kind of get them again, like Melinda was saying, you know, exploring nature and really kind of seeing the colors and the, you know, smelling the smells and all of that. I have a different group. Can you hear me? I don't know. I think I'm still muted. No, we can hear you. No, we can hear you. Oh, I have between 50 and 93 year olds in a class and I'm Allison by the way I live in Felton but I have a class in Redwood City California not far from you uh, my group of, of adults are we meet at the uh, in a park at the senior center 
And most of the, my students have gardens and go out in nature uh, anyway. So I'm thinking of, we've been together about 10 years and uh, they're watercolors for the most part. And uh, I'd like them to venture out and explore nature journaling to expand their horizons a little bit. You get a little old, you get a little complacent in your uh, activities and where you go and what you do. So I thought this would be an excellent way for them to, uh, maybe when they're out on their walks with their dogs and things like this, they could be picking up things, bringing them back and, and uh, we could explore these things a, a lot more in detail. Uh, the ideas that you have for the younger children actually work well for seniors too. So it's not just, uh, uh, it's amazing because we all uh, sort of relax when we get older and begin to see things more in a childlike, delightful way. And I think this would be very good for, for this group. We'd love to have Jack come and teach us. Can't hear you. Uh, I'm in your area, so I'd, I'd love to come up and, and meet your group. That sounds like fun. I, I, I have it's so much fun working with all sorts of different ages. You just sort of realize, like, isn't this just a beautiful species? Yeah. Well, we yeah. thought of, of getting in contact with you as soon as we can go back to, we were thinking of September, yeah. but it, it doesn't look that way. Yeah. That <clears throat> no, I, I, I think uh, expect COVID to be here and dangerous for quite a while. My uh, son works for Apple, and they're not going back for at least till after Christmas. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think at the, the, the very least. So we just want to, we'll play it safe, but um, but yes, we'd love to, to, to come play with you. I think they'd all enjoy it, and they, they do like to uh, watercolor their flowers and, and various things, so I think a, more of a concentrated effort. I know birds are quite popular, and I, was, I got through part of the parrot class with you uh, the other day, and I was sitting outside the other day and looking more carefully at the birds that I have. I'm up in Felton, I'm in the middle of the redwoods and I have maybe 10 different kinds of birds that come to our feeder every day. And I was observing more of them because of the class and I thought, oh, I didn't know that anything about that, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that they would enjoy it a lot and uh, collecting things. Uh, the, different comments that people have made uh, really good. I'm excited. Yeah, this, um, just to, to, to bounce off several ideas that have been going on here, I just want to, to make sure that people heard these ideas as they were coming by, because there's some really, really good stuff. We have kind of a critical mass of, of, of people with experience and, and creative ideas here. And it's really, really fun. I think, uh, do people notice the, the, the moment, the comments that um, Kathy, uh, made about uh, using sort of stamps and 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 nature prints and rubbings and so she's saying it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a drawing um, something that's neat about a journal when you do have a journal is you're starting to this becomes your brain on paper and you're downloading an experienced paper and then later on you look at it like oh yeah remember when so it's this this crazy remember when book and um, so if you're not, so making, making drawings is, is great. Um, and so, so but by the way, so when I'm saying that I want to start with kind of engage and then use the journal, I'm not saying don't use the journal, right? I want to be really, really clear about that because I'm all about the journal, right? Um, but um, using some of that the, of, of Kathy's bag of tricks. So the idea of your journal as a collage is great. So you can bring out a stamp pad and get leaves and get one side inky and make, you know, and, and, and make and sort of mark making with your journals. Think about fish printing with things that aren't fish, right? Is it messy? Yes. And that's really good. Um, and um, rubbings. If you've got a journal and you've got a crayon and you've got a leaf, those images are really cool. And then you see what happens if you use a different color crayon and you put that on the, a different leaf in a different place and then you rub from the other side. <sighs> right? That's, this, is, this is big fun. And then what you can do is let's say you've got a page and it's got several leaves 
on it that you've done rubbings of, you can then also draw on top of those leaves, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. add written notes on the page. Now, if your students are too um, young to write, um, there's a couple of ways to, um, to, to handle it. Um, one is don't write. Another is to, um, you know, you can, if they're just like learning, they've got a few letters. Um, and you can, you know, write, you know, you know, can, does anybody, you know, what do you see on your page? I see a leaf. Okay, what color, what letter does that start with? It starts with the letter L and everybody can draw a letter L. Great. And then you can even do that with green crayon. Right. Um, and so you're, but another thing that is, that, that I, when I first, when I first thought about this, I was like, like really torn because the idea of somebody else writing in your journal, I was thinking like that could be, that could be a problem. But I've worked with a bunch of homeschool parents who um, were regularly doing this and they showed me like they, they would sit there, it became this kind of neat bonding moment with the, the um, with their kids where they'd sit down and they'd say, right, tell me what words you want to use to describe this and I can help you collect those in the journal. That's and so they I were did. saying- I did that when my kids were four and five when they started nature journaling. We homeschool and I would ask them, you know, we would talk about like descriptive words and stuff and they would describe the things and then we would, I would just write the descriptions they gave me in their journals. Yeah. And, and something that's really fun about that is you can put it is not translated into proper adult speech, but you, whatever they say, I'm putting it down, whatever they say, I'm putting it down. And these things are so much fun to look at later on. It's really, really, really sweet. Um, and so you're respecting their ideas with words. And it doesn't, it ends up not having the feeling of like, you can't write, so I'm going to have to write for you. But it's like, your ideas and words are wonderful. I'm going to help you collect those. Right? So um, now if you're in a classroom with many more, with a bunch of kids, that becomes a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Perhaps this can be handled with a student aid. Um, but um, so those are, those are, um, th those are, those are some useful, useful strategies, but you start to get things in a book. Um, and I also recommend that in addition to all those, the, the print making, making prints, making rubbings, collecting really things, things. So what you, when you find a neat leaf, um, you, you, the kids will soon experiment with it. When I have that thing pressed in my book and I'm trying to press a pine cone, it doesn't work very well, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, what things do press well, what things don't press well. And so you can go press something in your book and then come back to it. And then a few da days later, you get out some, a big thing of, of the sort of wide packing tape and you can open it up. And ideally the part of the thing that happens is when something is pressed, it starts to kind of lose its moisture into the paper. And once it's, dried out a little bit, you can then put a piece of packing tape over the top of it to help hold it in there really, really nicely. Um, and um, if you do that too early, then it gets moldy underneath the tape, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's, that's another uh, strategy that you can use. But I just wanted to make sure that um, Kathy had thrown some of those ideas into the chat box. And I wanted to make sure if somebody's not reading the chat box that those um, those strategies did not get did not get lost. Oh, Kathy's back. She's just she's just if you guys check out the, the chat box, she's just sitting here just like dropping bombs into <laughs> that 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 chat box over there. Um, there's That's actually uh, yeah, Avea yeah. has got another thing. So there's be, be sure to check this out. Avea, did you want to say something out loud about um, some of your strategies and things that you're I wanted to, to mention that we're working on uh, monarch butterfly par, uh, pollination gardens and curriculum for kids. And the journaling is one of the ideas for the curriculum. And of course, basing it from three, uh, third grade to fifth grade, it's a little, you know, there are a lot of ideas here that are excellent for that. But I'm working with a group here and we're trying to get a butterfly uh, pollination path from the coast up through our mountain area here we're near highway nine which you probably are familiar with and making a pathway for the butterflies so that they can make it up the hill 
So uh, a lot of this is a great idea, especially, uh, you know, what plants need to be there and they could go in the journal and uh, they learn more about what actually needs to be planted and cared for there and get the non-native plants out of the way and things like that. So that's uh, one of the things we're working on. Nice. Um, Avea, did you want to, to share something? Um, sure. Um, so I work um, with preschoolers. Um, I get, um, they kind of do a rotation where I meet with a third of them and then the next third and then the next third. And they usually have me working with the older kids, although they've begun having me um, work with the younger ones now. So this is really helpful for me figuring out what to do with the youngers. Um, I teach gardening to them and I've been trying to incorporate some kind of nature journaling writing element in um, just to get them used to doing that. So we usually do a unit, maybe it's on worms and talking about soil or um, about like the five senses lab, that one's really fun, or critter counts, which gets numbers into it. And so we'll do that activity. Um, and then afterwards, I'll have the other kids sit down and draw something that they experienced that day. Um, so that they'll, they'll start getting used to drawing the things that are cool to them. Um, it can be something about the activities, um, or it could be like a cool flower or a cool critter that they saw. Um, and then, and then when people like, sometimes we'll get to this point where half the group is still drawing and then the other half of the group are done with their drawing and they're kind of fidgeting. So I, then I bring along a book to match the theme of the day. Like maybe it's like, if you plant a seed and then I'll read this to them or, or maybe it's about trees. My personal favorite is compost stew and I don't have it on hand. Um, and so then they get to see like different kinds of art in the garden. Um, and then um, just kind of enjoy that. Plus it can be very soothing for them. Uh, and then we've, I, at the end of the year, I put all of their papers together. Although listening to this, I've been, I'm thinking that maybe I should just have a pre-made journal so that they can decorate it. And so it's theirs from the very start because they get very, um, they get very attached to their papers. And in the beginning, before they get used to like the fact that I'm going to give them all back at the end of the year, they don't want to let them go. And so I'm thinking that this discussion's taught me that I need to maybe have a pre-made journal for them so that they can draw all over it, make it theirs from the very start. Um, and I was struggling to think about what to do with the younger kids because a lot of them don't really like to sit still and draw things. But with the nature prints idea, that's really a good idea. And then they can still decorate it and make it theirs. So thank you. Can you make a short comment? Um, um, Ashley, yes, uh, you have to speak up a little bit, Ashley. Yeah. I don't think that you're um your speaker is is that any better oh much better yes okay good i i have kind of a faulty headset so i apologize for the difficulties um so i i am a doctoral student at um in idaho and um normally right now i'm working with uh graduate and undergraduate students but i was able to work for a while as an education specialist at the idaho state um, Museum of Natural History. And one of the really fun things that we did there, um, working with a wide range of students, um, anywhere from like first grade to uh, people in their 90s. Um, but we, especially for the younger students, liked to give the, the kids a place to start with their drawings. So when I was teaching about tree species, I drew like half a silhouette of the tree sort of split vertically and then gave them these silhouettes of different species for them to then copy the other side of the silhouette. And then we would talk about the different characteristics and, and have them include that kind of thing in just this really simple silhouette outline. And then um, when we were working with things like butterflies or even like snakes and lizards, I would give them just the very simple outline of the butterfly and then give them an actual specimen to draw from. And so then they would have the opportunity to use their color pencils or their pencil to draw the same pattern that they saw on those butterfly wings inside that outline. And I think that that was good for a lot of students, especially because I wasn't working with the same groups of students over and over again. It was just kind of like come once a year, different kinds of field trips and things like that. And so it was a really easy way to get all of the students kind of involved in it, not just the ones who liked drawing and art. 
and that they were, um, it really took the pressure off of them of like having to get the butterfly wings to perfect shape before they could start making observations on the color. And so I think that that might be a good thing for some of you, um, for the, the woman who said she was working with her pollinator garden that you could do outlines of the different pollinators and then have those um, individuals color in what they actually see when they're looking in those gardens or something like that. Um, Ashley, I like those sort of uh, the way what, what she's doing is she's giving the students just a little bit of scaffolding. And then once you see that, you know what to do from there. Um, that sounds that sounds really successful. I have something to share that's for a, a higher level. Do we have time? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I'm cozy. I'm from uh, outside of Philadelphia, but today I'm in San Francisco and I have a poor connection. So please flag me if I'm not coming through. Um, I was teaching um, fractal math and uh, the idea of symmetries. There's 17 kinds of symmetries in math, but, but most of them are really way beyond me. Uh, using nature to 10 and 12 year olds. So my goal was for them to understand the concept and to understand that um, these things are found in nature. I later did a, another kind of numerical study similar to what you were talking about with the thistle drawing of the, the Fibonacci sequence. But for this lesson with um, per particularly um, the, oh, can you still see me? Are we almost yes, done? Yes, no, no, no we're, we're good. You're with us. Sorry about that. My screen, my screen went blank. Um, uh, the symmetry, I mean, we're all familiar with bilateral symmetry. We talk about, I can't use both hands to show you, but you know, like <laughs> lying down the middle, symmetry. <laughs> well, there's also, like, yeah, please demonstrate all of these for me <laughs> on your body. All right. So there's, um, there's, symmetry in the horizontal plane also. Oh, you are so grounded. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Stay with me. Horizontal symmetry. So you would have, that would be flip symmetry is what they call that. There's also rotational symmetry. So whether things have um, symmetry when you pick one single point and turn them. So, if you, so I had, this, the assignment was to go find four leaves that were the same. And that was the hardest part of it, because it's very hard to find four leaves that are the same. And after we briefly observed the, symmet the bilateral symmetry of a leaf, we then just used the leaves like we could have used any other object and pasted them on paper, demonstrating rotational symmetry, demonstrating flip symmetry. That's this one. You don't have to draw on anything for that one. Um, uh, the fractal lesson. Okay. <laughs> the fractal lesson began with having them hold up a maple leaf and observing that the branches of the maple tree spike off of the vein the same way that the maple leaf veins spike off of the center rib. And it's the same for oak tree and oak leaf. So there's the jumping off point for those lessons. It would take a book and some writing to set up the lesson, I'm sure. But I wanted to let you know that. You can have 12 year olds still engaged out in the field. Yes. I, I, I Questions? Really, <laughs> <laughs> bilaterally symmetrical here. Um, yeah. You have to say everything twice now. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Say it here first. So, uh, also, what you're, you're doing with that is you're, you're starting with explorations in nature you're you're mm -hmm. documenting this stuff Sorry. and that makes whatever you're doing then in fractals relevant right it was uh, sort of about telling somebody at a desk with a piece of paper and a pencil about fractals you could talk all day and they're not gonna see the relationship to their lives yeah. and those those structures um, but then once you teach them they see it in every commercial. It's in every magazine ad. It's great. I like that. So, well, so thank you very much. Somebody else's turn now. <laughs> can I? I was. Can I share some? I wanted to show, like, I was explaining to somebody the journals that we made. I don't know if I can. 
Let me see if I can. Very just, nice. With my weird background, hang on. Hold it against your chest. Oh, I have to, you might have to turn off your um, yeah. your background momentarily so that we could see it. There we go. How do I turn it off? If you go down to um, stop stop video and the, click the little arrow. Oh, there it, it is. Yeah, let me turn yeah. that off. Uh, how do I go to? It should oh. it be a button down there on the stop video. If you click the um, little arrow, it says your virtual background. You should be able nope, to. Nope, that changed it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Was, all right. So, nope. Now it added a. Oh, now, now you're a tropical thing. smile. What the heck? Stop. Oh, here, none. Now I got it. All right, there we go. So this is like, this is the one that I made out of an envelope, like a mailing envelope. Um, and so it's like tri-folded. But the cool thing is there's a little pouch here so you can put stuff in it. Oh. And then I just stapled the paper. So it also can be kind of reusable because you can take the paper out and put more in. Um, so it's just one mailing envelope that you cut and then um, you cut to fold it. And so there's that. This is somebody wait, mentioned. Wait, wait, wait. Can, oh, can you please. show us again <laughs> how, um, show, <laughs> sort of help us sort of envision it as an uncut envelope and then so, see what you did. Um, all right. So this is what the mailing envelope looks like, right? So I cut up here. So you have to cut the you have to cut the sides open. Oh, okay. I see what you're up to. And then once you cut the sides open, um, and you, cut down the middle there. Yeah, you kind of you cut up one side of it. Yeah, and, and then this and then this you glue right here. Yeah. So there's a cool. little pouch. So these are what we're using next year. I actually made um, 350 of them to hand out in an event that got canceled. So. <laughs> And then somebody mentioned like just the, like this one's just with um, like a poster board cut. And then like I just hole punched and do twine and the kids can like put a stick on it as the spine. So these are- with the file folder too, right? Yeah, with like the file folders. Yeah, cool. um, and I did put a little pocket on these. Like I just glued a little pocket. Yep. You let the kids pick like what paper they wanted and then they, um, decorated it um so because every year i have a different design um and then if you don't want to make something i was going to share these little books dollar tree has them um they come in like a pack of six maybe for a buck and i love these like this is our sea life field trip journal um like we have a journal for the zoo we have a journal for the aquarium we, we have a nature journal so, um, but these are really great. Um, um, and the Dollar Tree one, how many pages are there? Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight like eight, eight pages. So we just use these though for like, I mean, if you were doing a program and maybe like giving people a journal to start with, like this might be a good option and then they can just decorate it or whatever. Um, and they come in different colors, like they're pink and blue and white and, um, also, Target has them too, but they're a little, um, they're more like a book. Uh, they're not this wide. So. Thank you, Kathy. Those are awesome. I'm going to be doing a program for our local library online, and the library wants to buy supplies um, to make sure that families have what they need. And these are really great because it's, it'll be inexpensive and easy to do. I love it. I have a couple ideas too for the, um, the journal that's so cheap, you can't believe it. This is just a single piece of paper, just folded in and out. And when we're done with this piece, you just give them another piece that they can just glue right in. The so one page is doubled up and you can keep going and add them, add them. And what's so great about them is then when you want to see them all, you can set them up like on a tabletop or something, you know, and display them that way or hang them on the wall that way. And they can see all their pages at once which is kind of fun. And this is a whole lot like the one, Kathy, you did. Only the only difference was they had the kids run out and find a stick 
And then this is just a, it's held together with just a single rubber band. And you punch two holes and the rubber band just comes up and you loop it over the stick on both sides. And the kids get active then in finding the stick so then they can put their whole journal together and all I had to do is grab paper and I had the kids all fold one end in a little bit so that it would open more easily and lay flat more easily and then we stuck this on and just looped it on two sides it was so easy it was like show us how point. you did the fold yeah sure what I did was I if I knew that I was going to make the spine about three quarters of an inch in um, then what I did was I made this line one inch in and I used a spoon. Each kid had a spoon. So let me show you if this is the end of the paper, I had them fold it like on the one inch and I gave them all like, what does an inch look like? You know, we had rulers and we had pieces of paper, whatever is easiest for you. And then we just used a spoon to roll down the edge to make it stick, you know, a good, a good fold. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's so cheap to do that. But I actually personally really love these little booklets and just they can add to it so they can make it as thick as they want. And, you know, they can make as many and you can make it as big as you want. I've done really big ones of these too. It's just fun and easy. Oh, uh, that is... Hold out journal. That, that, out that idea is gold. Yeah, <laughs> cheap. <laughs> and easy. Mm. Just give them one big piece of paper. What else do we have? Yeah, yeah. This is this is this was absolute gold, folks. Um, uh, so this is our our nature journal educator form. Every week, we're going to have a chance to get together. I'm going to encourage everybody to let's meet here on a regular basis and bring your best questions and your best ideas. So if you have some thoughts or ideas, things that you have been doing in your homeschool, in your classroom, at your center, share those with everybody else. And um, what we're going to do is just kind of crowdsource the best practices for um, for in, in environmental education, for, for teaching how, other people how to use nature journaling. Um, for our next class, I have a, a request uh, of, of a topic that I just want everybody to start to roll around in your head. Um, what I would like us to start to think about is what in, we're going to be doing some of this online for a while, and I'm considering making a series of, of online workshops for classrooms. Um, what do you think um, if you had a series of little workshops that somebody could just, uh, that a student could plug into? Um, what do you think about length? What do you think about format? What do you think about content? What do you think about what sorts of things seem to be working in those sorts of situations? Does anybody have any uh, other ideas about um, how to uh, strategies that are working in an online situation for teaching other people how to do nature journaling. Um, I know Melinda, you've got been getting a lot of, 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 of practice and experience yeah. with this. You're going to have a ton of ideas, but I want everybody else to be thinking about this as well. We, um, we're not going to be talking about it so much in this workshop because um, our hour's about up. Um, but that, that we will be kind of coming back to that. Um, before we go, um, in, in this one though, does anybody have any other thoughts, ideas, things to share um, for, uh, for the, the community that are on the, the topic here? And um, also the, 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 the woman in red who started us off with this great question. I don't know your name. Lynn. Quinn? Lynn, L-Y-N-N. Lynn. Lynn. All right, so Lynn, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for starting us off in this direction. It's been, there's been a bunch of really, really useful strategies. And I love kind of crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing these beautiful ideas. 
Um, Jack, can I share one, one last um, journal before we move on? Because this is super easy, okay? So this is a little journal, pocket journal, that you can make. It's got pages that you turn out of one sheet of printer paper. So you can get the instructions online. I can't remember what they're called, but it basically it's just taking um, one big sheet of paper, folding it half lengthwise, folding it again the other direction until you have these little squares. And then you cut with scissors right here. Then, like magic, you have a little booklet. And I've made some of these and put it in my pocket when I go um, nature journal. So I have my nature journal with me everywhere I go. And sometimes even when I walk my dog and go birding. But yesterday I had to use a little piece of, you know, a little pocket paper because with binoculars and a dog leash um, it, and a pen, it's just a real kind of chaotic. So I have this in my pocket and on my phone to take pictures. But something like this is really easy because it has enough strength that, you know, you can write on it. It's small. And it might be a fun thing to do with some kids, you know, maybe if you had an event or something and they make a little journal and then they find, right, one thing that they can draw on, or it might be too small. I don't know. It's just kind of, but I just thought it was kind of a cool idea that you can make a book from one sheet of paper. So that's just wanted to share that. And how many pages in your book? Um, let's see. It's got, um, let's see, with the cover, it's one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight sides that you can write on. So. You are dangerous, Melinda. Yeah. You know, but one thing she could also do with that too, Melinda, is you could yeah. just put, once you had like four or five of them. Yeah, put them together. Them all. Yes, you know? and, and sew them like signatures, like a book, like a real yeah. book. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Ooh, I'll have to experiment. Or just use a rubber band to hold them together if you don't have the time and want yeah. to make the whole book. But that is right through the center, right through here. Okay, great idea. Thanks, Jan. If you take some of the edges, you can make little pockets that the kids can stick. Their right. You can. They actually are. They are pocket. If you turn them the other way, they are pockets. So you could tape the edge of it, and it could be a little pocket. So, Melinda, yep. I, I actually have specialized knowledge. In, oh, in Philadelphia, one of the, thing, one of the things I've done is I've, I am the uh, paper maker at the oldest paper mill in the country, the site of the oldest paper mill. The mill's gone. I don't know but, who's talking. Um, that kind of folding is called, you can, oh, I'm so sorry. This is cozy. Oh, oh there you go. Um, the, the one with the magic marker, that one. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, uh, I, I made paper a lot, so all the things you can do with paper, that was the point. Um, that's called an octavo, and you pro if you can't find how to make that little flip book by looking up octavo, try looking up magic book. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, and if you look up, you might find this interesting, if you look up Martha Ballard's diary, B-A-L-L-A-R-D-S. She's a woman journalist who, there were so few of them uh, during, just after the American Revolution. She folded things up like that and carried them with her. And then later they were bound into volumes that are in the Harvard Library. Oh, cool. And they're really interesting. The, the uh, book, The Midwife's, The Midwife's Secret, The Midwife's Tale was written based on her diaries. And that's all I have to say about that. Thanks. Sure, uh, thank you for showing it to us. Hey, hey, Cozy, thank you for the, 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 uh, the, the next level on the octavo. <laughs> You're very welcome. That's how all of our books were made. They're, like paper was a certain size, so that's why books ended up to be a certain size, because how many times you folded them. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll be back in Philadelphia next week so I can use my regular nature to, How do you spell that, <laughs> to, to come up with ideas. Thanks, Cozy. Oct like uh, the, the number eight, Octavo. Okay. Right. So, um, friends, thank you so much for uh, tuning into this. Um, the, I know we could go on um, all day here, but I'm going to kind of keep us to about an hour so that 
um, so that we uh, people can kind of get about their day and, and count on this. But I want to encourage people to let's regularly check in together. I think that together with this kind of open source nature journaling idea sharing, we are going to be able to really uh, pull out some, some, some best practices very, very, very quickly. Um, this was, for me, uh, an absolute eye-opener, and I learned a ton from listening to your, your, your collective ideas. Thank you, folks, so much for this uh, group share. Um, before we go, I want to encourage everybody just to flip over to gallery view and take a look at some of the faces of, of other people who are, are, are doing this. Say hello to people out there. And, um, and we're going to be um, from different places around the country and around the world. We're going to be getting to know each other and um, we're going to build a community of educators um, connecting people with nature through journaling, art, drawing, science, nature, language, arts, integrating all those things back together. They used to be a seamless part of a whole. We've fractured them into little pieces, but together we can put them back together. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jack. Take care.